Hello friends, good afternoon and welcome to Edusite Live Lectures. Dear friends, as you know that in computer sciences we have started a series on networks and graphs and today we are conducting another lecture in the same series. In today's lecture we will try to understand the concept of application layer. To discuss this topic, we have with us our subject expert, Professor D.K. Lobial. Professor Lobial is still professor in School of Computer and System Sciences, JNU. Without further ado, I would like to welcome sir to our studios and request him to start the lecture. Welcome sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, friends, we studied various layers of network in detail. That is physical layer, data link layer, MAC as a sub layer of data link layer. Then we talked about network layer and then transport layer and within transport layer we talked about the functions of TCP. Now after studying so many layers, now the next question arises, what will run over it? What kind of services we are going to provide to a user who is going to use the internet or the network? That is where the application layer becomes very important. Now, <coughs> therefore, the application layer is going to provide you the various kind of services which a user will use. Now, before discussing on what kind of service it provides, three fundamental questions arise. One is, what are the objectives of an application layer? Then what are its functions? And then how these functions work? That is what we are going to discuss in this lecture. Now, if you look at the various objectives of a net of an application layer in the network, number one, it provides a very specific service to a user, right? Now, what application will run? That is what we are talking about. So, one specific service to a user, one this is one of the objective of the application layer. Then, it also must identify different services required by all users it must be distinguishing between the services that is another objective and third is to provide this service it must provide certain protocols as we said the protocols are a set of rules that will govern a service. So, we have to determine what are the rules to govern a specific service. This is what the are three objectives of application layer. Now, what functions it provides? How these objects will be fulfilled? these objectives will be fulfilled by providing certain functions. Now, one of the function is it provides an interface to the user to interact with the network. That means, when the user has to transfer something, some data and he has to use the network, how a user will interact with the network? He will interact with certain interface. So, application layer basically provides an interface to the user to interact with the network that is one function it has to perform and the second function is it can only provide a service or allow a user to interact with the network because only sorry only unless until unless it allows you to access the services of transport layer because at the lower level or if you leave user aside the network is providing all kind of services through transport layer to a user because transport layer will access the service of network layer, network layer accesses services of data link layer and data link layer accesses the services of physical layer. So, therefore, the application layer has to access the services of transport layer. Now, to provide other function is to provide a specific addressing mechanism. When the services are provided by the application layer, how different services are distinguished running on a system. Like if you are running an application like your internet explorer on your desktop, you can also run a Mozilla. Now, while you are running internet explorer as well as Mozilla on your desktop, when you are downloading some data when the data is downloaded on your computer, how does it differentiates whether it has to be shown through internal explorer or it has to be displayed to the user through Mozilla browser. So, that is when the data is downloaded at the desktop, now inside the desktop the application layer has to determine that it is a service to be displayed through internal explorer not through Mozilla or through Mozilla, not through Internet Explorer. So, that is the distinguishing between these two 
will be done by only if you provide a separate address to both the services. That means Internet Explorer will have a different address and the Mozilla will have a different address. If you talk in that terms, in the simple terms, we will explain in detail what does it mean. So, that is why the addressing mechanism is important. That's what, what kind of address? So, what is the format of the address? So, that is another kind of function this ablation layer has to provide so that we can differentiate between services. And then it also has to provide details of each protocol. Whatever protocol it provides at the application layer level and for each protocol it must define the details that how the protocol will work, what kind of address it will use and then so and so forth. That is what is the overall format of the protocol data unit. This is what is another function that the application layer has to provide. Now again it has to decide the type of service that is to be provided, the decide the type of each service, what kind of different services it has to provide. Now there are certain standard services that every user will require and there may be very specific kind of services which may be required by only some users, others may not require them. So, there are user specific services, there are common services which probably will be required by each and every user. We will explain in detail as you go. Now, if you look at this diagram, what do you see here is we talked about two models OSI model as well as TCP IP model. Now, if you look at these models where this application layer lies, if you look at the TCP IP model on the right what you see is we have a network access, then we have internal layer, then we have transport layer and over the transport layer we have application layer running. And if you look at the OSI model what you find is we have physical layer, then we have data link layer, then we have network layer, then transport layer. Above transport layer we have session layer and presentation layer and on top of that there is application layer. Now if you look at this that means what we are trying to say is what these three layers doing in OSI model that is application presentation and session all activities all functions provided by these three layers are mostly done by application layer in TCP IP model. Now if you say that that means what kind of services or applications are provided by the application layer or what kind of applications will run there. Now, if you look at there on the right most corner, it is a domain name system is one kind of service, hypertext transport protocol is another protocol which provides another kind of service. Then you have a simple mail transport protocol that is another kind of service. Then post office protocol POP, you might have heard of that, that is another kind of service and it is therefore to provide that service the POP is another protocol and then DHCP that is called dynamic host configuration protocol that we will talk about each one of them in detail. These are some common protocols they are required either by the users or by the network itself to provide the services or to control the operations of the network. So, this is how we look at it. Now, how this application layer actually works? Now, there are two models that works an application layer is either all applications layer protocols or all application layer services are either based on client server model applications or they are peer to peer application. The moment we say client server model based applications, now we are talking of a centralized administration where there is a server at the central location which will provide the service and these services will be accessed by the client from remote machines. Now that means until unless a client needs a service server will not do anything and the server will be governing and controlling all kind of accesses to it. And therefore implementation of security becomes easier that enforcement of security becomes easier because there is a central control. The moment I say central control that means there is a server and you, that which governs 
and decides whether the service has to be provided to a user or not on the request of a client and the client so therefore the security aspect is easier so there is a client with request there is a server which provides the services now the other kind of model is a peer to peer applications where there is no central control and one machine one desktop can provide service to other desktop no none of them is a server other none of them is a client or both of them are either client or as well as servers because they are independent and here the client is in the previous case the client was depending on the server for services here and therefore it is easier for the server to control in the peer to peer case these are two independent entities still they communicate and they provide service to each other that is they exchange whatever data they have to exchange with each other so it is a centralized mechanism so neither one of them is governing anyone or controlling any other so therefore it is difficult to enforce the security so in a peer to peer application it becomes very difficult to implement security therefore most of the applications which we talk here or the services which you talk here are based on client server model or if any user is is developing a service mostly they develop services largely based on client server model and very rarely you will find there are peer to peer applications are very rare in practice now what is a client after all now at many times when we refer to a client or a server and the general connotation goes as if we are referring to a hardware component but in real sense they are software component both client as well as server but still in practice we try to refer to a hardware machine as a client or as a server why do we do that i'll come but first let us understand when you are referring to client server what is a client client is a piece of software basically and so is the server so what is that software the client is a process running on a machine and requesting some information from the server which is another process server is a process which may be running on another machine now that means it is client process running on a machine which will initiate the data exchange request so first possibly if it is a connection oriented model that is the client server interacts based on connection oriented mechanism first the client will request for a connection and if the server agrees then the connection will be established between client and server only after that the client will start exchanging of data now that means what i am saying the client is a process which initiates a request for exchange of data number 1 and from client one can upload data on the server and how does client initiate that means the client must know the address of a server only then it can send a request to the server so without knowing the address of a server it is difficult to request a service from the server so the client is supposed to know the initial address of the server which you call url or a uniform resource locator that will come afterward and then while client is requesting from a server because it knows in advance the address of a server so while it is requesting it will send its own address so that the server also knows the address of the client so the server can revert back with the response to the client so client is requesting and sending its own address that is what the client process mean and it will execute as and when a user has to request something from the server and then it will start a client whereas if you look at the server process server is also a process which will respond on the request of a client and but this process should be running continuously the moment i say this process should be running continuously the reason is that the server never knows when a request from a client will come so therefore you cannot say that whenever a request will come i'll run the server process that cannot be done so therefore 
the server process should run or must run continuously. So, it is a continuously running process and it will respond to the client request. Now, second is it must be able to handle multiple requests because multiple users will send requests. Like if there is a Google server, you know how many Google clients or how many users across the world may be requesting to the Google server for some data. There may be millions or a large number of users may be requesting to a Google server. Now, that means the Google server, the process running on the Google machine must be able to handle multiple requests. So, therefore, in, in practice if you look at there cannot be a single server because if there is a single server, it may not be able to handle a large number of requests. Therefore, there are multiple machines or a cluster of machines where the server process is running on multiple machines. And since these machines are dedicated only to run those, those softwares like Google server, if I put it, so the a process which is at the Google server is running on n number of machines, 100 cluster machines which forms a cluster at the Google service center. So, therefore, and each of these machine is running only Google server, nothing else. So, they are dedicated servers. That means, the hardware is dedicated to run only that server process. Therefore, what I said in the beginning, sometimes when you refer to client as server, we indicate to a hardware. That is why, since this hardware is running only one server, therefore, we refer to a hardware machine as a server. If you run multiple server processes on a single machine, then probably we cannot say this is so and so server. We can say this is a server machine, but you cannot say what kind of server it is. So, when only one server process is running, that is why in a loose manner, we refer to a hardware machine as a server machine. Right? So, that is not wrong, that is also practically correct. And the other task of the server is to keep everything in order. So, it is controlling all requests. If the request is coming, in which order the request has to be served and that is what the server has to maintain. And that means, the server relies on a service called a server daemon. That is what I am referring server daemon, I am referring to a process which is running continuously on a server machine. That is what a server daemon mean. And that keeps on running on the background, that daemon will keep on running on the background and it will keep on listening to the request for the set service, because server never knows when a request will come. So, that means, this daemon will run continuously and waiting for request all the time. So, listening to the request at any time a request comes, this daemon will take a request and then provide the service. And then can exchange messages as appropriate and send request data to the client and so on and so forth. At the end, when the exchange of data between the client and server is complete, then this exchange must be closed. In a connection oriented service, that means when client begins a request from the server and when it initiates, then a connection will be established between a client and a server. And then only through that connection, the data exchange will take place. And towards the end, when the client has completed its exchange of data, then it must request for closure of the connection. So, keep one thing in mind, the connection request is initiated by client and similarly, the connection closure request is also initiated by a client. So, the client will request for closing a connection and the server must agree, but the question is there is a handshake, the moment I say handshake and generally this handshake is a three way handshake not two way. Probably you might have heard of two way handshake, I extend my hand, other person will extend his hand, this is a two way handshake. Now, here we are talking of three way handshake. The meaning hereby is when the client makes a request for a connection, then the server must agree that it agrees to establish a connection 
And then further the client says, yes, I also agree. That is what the three ways. That is one way is the client makes a request. The second way is the server agrees to the request. Then final, the third way, the client agrees to what server agrees to. It may happen that server makes a request, client responds, but it does not respond to everything what client said. So therefore, client may not agree afterward. So therefore, if the server has responded and the client has responded back that I agree everything to it. What does this handshake and exchange mean? The handshake and exchange mean while you are establishing a connection or while a connection is being established between a client and a server, they are agreeing or negotiating certain parameters. That is, what will be the size, buff, size of the buffer of the client? What will be the size of a buffer of a server? Accordingly, the data exchange will take place. And then when the data is being exchanged, each data packet will be sent and will have a unique identification number, sequence number. So that, that we set a transport layer that every transport segment has a sequence number. And so that when they arrive at the server or at the client, vice versa, they may not arrive in the order in which they have been transmitted. If they have not arrived in the order, then it is the responsibility of the server or the client who is receiving the data. Its duty is to put them all the segment in the order. How does it put in the order? It puts in the order only by knowing the sequence number because the first sequence number will come first, the second packet to the second sequence number will come second, so and so forth. Therefore, the sequence number is important. And while the negotiation or the three-way handshake is taking place, the client also tell that what will be the starting sequence number of the data which I will send. And similarly, the server can also respond to what is the initial sequence number of the data which I am transmitting because the next data will have one more sequence number previous plus one, then previous plus one, but the initial has to be exchanged. When I am saying three-way handshake, we are talking of exchange of the various parameters or the negotiation of the various parameters between the client and server that takes place and both the parties agrees to that negotiation and then the exchange takes place. That is what the connection establishment mean here now because we are talking of a logical connection, not a physical connection that which we have talked in previous lectures what the physical connection mean and what a logical connection mean. So, once these agreement has taken place after negotiation and that is what a logical connection mean now and the exchange can take place. Now, look at this, if you look at this diagram, so this on the client side, there is a process running which is a client process and on the server side, there is a process which is called a server process. And the client side, the client process is interacting with the TCP if it is a connection oriented. And on the server side, right hand side, the process running as a server process is also interacting with the TCP layer of the server. Now, what does it mean? That means the all data of the client process will be copied into the TCP buffer of the client and all the data from the application layer, the process will copy on the TCP buffer of the server process because server is also running all layers, physical, data, internet and TCP layer and so each client is running all the layers. Now, that means how does a client process writes its data on the buffer of TCP and how does a server process or reads data from the buffer of the TCP or writes back to the buffer of the TCP. If you look at this diagram, what we have shown is the process, the between the process and the TCP, we have shown a blue mark that is what we call a socket. So, for client server application development, the socket programming is very, very important. And the moment you say socket programming, that means what is a socket? And if you look at electric socket everyone knows we have to plug then only the electricity will start flowing. Similarly here the socket means the application the process application process has to plug into the TCP. That means TCP provides a data structure or a set of functions 
through which if application layer or the process on application layer uses those functions of TCP, then it can transfer the data to the TCP and how does it provides a data structure which is a socket. That means, what are the various fields of that socket? It must provide the address of the machine, it must provide the address of the transport layer, it must provide the address of the application layer and so and so forth and that how much data it can send and what kind of service it is using. All this data it has to provide and the TCP buffer will store all these kind of data. And it is happening on the both the sides and that is how the whole communication takes place. In a peer to peer model, there is no dedicated server as in case of client server. So, there are two or more computers connected and are able to share their resources and without having a kind of master slave. If I say master slave, that means server is a master and I see client as a, as, as a slave. It may not be a truly master slave, but it can be seen that. And the, in case of peer to peer, the resources are decentralized and at the end devices function as both client and server and the user accounts and access rights are set for individual devices and the security becomes a very, very difficult task. So, that is what the difference between client server and a peer to peer model is. Thank you. client server model and there is a peer to peer application and I said in the beginning most of the services or the applications are based on client server model. Now, having our base on that that the all applications almost are based on client server model then what kinds of applications are there? What are the various types of application? If you remember in the diagram I showed you there is a domain name service, there is HTTP that is hypertext transfer protocol, there was DSCP and then we saw SMTP all these are different kind of services. Now, different services now if I divide these services into various categories or types that is what we are saying what are the different types of applications. Now, there are three major types of application that traditional applications then there are multimedia applications, there are infrastructure service kind of application. The moment we say traditional applications, we are simply referring to the application that where the client sends a request and the server will send a reply, it will happen in both case but a simple paradigm and that means I can develop my own application where I can de uh, develop a client and I can develop a server. I can deploy them in different machines and use them and send requests and they will make certain, they will provide certain services. And then the users send request to the server which then responds accordingly. These are any normal applications and I will explain that with the help of example, but there are multimedia applications which will have a different requirement. Like what I said is these applications, multimedia applications requires resources, allocation of resources in the network so that a desired quality of service is achieved or provided 
to an application. That means, in a traditional application, simply a request is sent and a reply comes, and it, rather than bothering about anything else, the client will start and server. But in case of a multimedia application, the resources have to be allocated. What does it mean now? Now, if a video or a video is required to be downloaded from the server and it has to be streamed online, you want to watch a video online. So, there is a video server which has a large number of videos stored there. There is a client. When the client requests for the video and the server sends the video and it cannot send video in one go, it will send packet by packet and that has to be displayed on the client machine. While it is being done this, what will happen is that streaming online only few bytes has come. That is what many times you see on the screen that please wait it is being buffered. That means, in advance some data has to be stored in the buffer of the client, so that it can be played on the client machine, so that the client can, dis, can, can see it, watch it. And now the question is, because video files are larger in size, even if you compress them, they have a good enough size, so they will require large bandwidth for transfer. If the bandwidth is small, the transfer will take more time. And if it takes more time, then the user has to wait or the client has to wait that the video will come and then it will play. And no user at any point of time or at any cost would like to wait for a long period of time. And any time you are accessing internet and watching a movie on the internet, you expect that the video comes immediately and watch the movie. But it will depend on the bandwidth available. Now, if the bandwidth is not available, much bandwidth is not available, data will come slowly and you will have to wait and the wait for a longer time. That means, the latency or the end to end delay is very high. So, to avoid that, in advance when the client server establish a connection for a multimedia application, during the connection establishment, the required bandwidth must be allocated. So, that the required amount of data is transmitted or downloaded from the server to the client within a reasonable time without large delay, so that the user achieves a required quality of service and it feels good. That means, yes, I am downloading immediately and watching the video. So, that is why we are saying the multimedia kind of applications will require allotment of resources in advance. That means, while you are establishing connection, the bandwidth resource as a bandwidth must be allocated in advance. Right? So, which is a traditional application will not require that the bandwidth should be allotted in advance. No, whatever bandwidth is available in case of traditional applications, the data will be transmitted through that bandwidth because it is not the delay will not matter and, and the delay is not going to make much difference. And when I am saying this, I am talking of delay in terms of small time in milliseconds or seconds, not in terms of minutes and hours. And the third kind of services or applications are infrastructure services. That means, in addition to the, the traditional services and the multimedia applications, there are certain applications which are required for maintenance of the internet services. I will categorize them and talk this later, but one is simple, I need a service it will provide, second is I need multimedia services, third is I do not need a user does not require any service, but the network itself requires. Like the network at this CEC may require certain services from the router, so that connection is all, all the time maintained, whatever is required by the network for its information exchange, all these kind of data is accessed by the network. So, therefore, certain applications must be running and those applications are categorized as an infrastructure service type application. So, broadly three kinds of right. Now, if you look at this list, then what each application requires? Now, the file transfer is one of the application. That means, I require to download a file from a server. So, my machine I will work as a client, machine will work as a client and a file will download it from a server. Right. So, it is called a file transfer application. 
and the protocol name is called FTP, File Transfer Protocol. And that protocol will govern the transfer of a file from a server to a client. And it does not require that delay does not matter, even if right and data loss does not take place because it will come again because it is a connection oriented service. If a packet is lost, it will again request and retransmission will come. And even if take while we download files, it takes at hours, we never mind. When you download simple movie and watch it offline, even it takes 2 hours, 3 hours a day, you do not mind put it on and the, the files are downloaded. That is a traditional service. And loss does not occur because it is a connection oriented. And the size bandwidth requirement is variable because some files may be small in size, some files may be larger in size. So, therefore, file download will require different size of bandwidth. And the latency, it is not latency sensitive, delay, it is not delay sensitive, delay does not matter. Even if the file is downloaded in 5 hours, does not matter. If it download in 1 hour, good, well, but it will not going to lose anything. Whereas, same is the case with the web documents. When you open www or http, you try to search a website and that means from a web server, you are downloading certain pages and then watching them, seeing them. So, data loss does not take place because it is a connection oriented service. And again, you may be downloading a page which is large in size, a page which may be small in size, therefore, the bandwidth requirement is also variable. And it is not very delay sensitive and that means, if the delay is beyond a certain limit, it does not matter. While the moment we say delay sensitive services, the meaning hereby is, if the delay exceeds certain time period, then the service may not be usable. That is what delay sensitive services mean. That means, if you are watching a video online or streaming it, if it takes too much of time, one frame comes, the next frame comes, then you may not understand what it is showing or in the audio. If the audio, there is a big gap in the speech, then you listen to a broken audio. If you listen on the voice over IP, if you have ever talked on voice over IP, what you find it you listen a broken voice from the other side. That happens because there is a big delay because it is based on IP protocol, the bandwidth is not allocated fix. If the packet transfer takes long time because the bandwidth is not available, so it will take longer time. So, if the two packets arrive with a long gap and when it is played as a speech, there will be a broken speech and you will not be able to understand. So, that is what the delay sensitive means. That means, the packet must arrive within a, strip, within a stipulated time. If it does not arrive, the service cannot be identifiable or cannot run smoothly. That is what. So, a real time audio video, they are delay sensitive. That means, in this case, if it is not transmitted within 100 millisecond or 100 so millisecond, 200 millisecond, 100 millisecond, then the service is useless. So, it is delay sensitive service. A few megabytes, few kilobytes, variable bandwidth and loss tolerant. Even if in some service, if some loss occurs, it may not matter, but I get a service. Example I give you, if you are watching a cricket match online, through the client server model or the network. You like to watch a match in real time, even if the quality of the video is not very good, not very good. good time. That means, it is identifiable. If the ball is color is not very red, fine, does not matter. But you are able to watch what is being played and able to make out, even if the quality is not good, you will not never mind. But if the quality is very good and you are not watching in real time, what has been played, you see it after 10 minutes, you will not like it to happen. So, therefore, in such kind of services, the loss may be tolerated, but the delay cannot be tolerated. So, these are certain audio, real time audio video kind of services, which therefore will require the allocation of bandwidth. This is the multimedia application now. First two web document and file transfer, these are traditional application, whereas the real time audio video and if it is stored audio video, you store and play and same as interactive video that must be transmitted in few seconds. And so is the interactive game which you play on the internet. There is a delay sensitive, it must reach within certain time, even if there is some loss. So, we may tolerate loss, but you cannot sustain more delay. And that is what are your multimedia applications. 
and so happens with your final financial application. But like if I have to maintain my services like DSCV protocol which talk about will talk is a kind of infrastructure based service we will talk a little later. Now if you look at this diagram now on the left corner we have all seven layers of OSI model physical layer and the uh, the data link layer, network layer, transport layer, session layer, presentation layer, application layer and if you look at TCP IP model, the lowest yellow color is we have a uh, host to network interface, then over that we have IP, that is I say network to host interface, that means we are talking about both the layers, data link layer and physical layer combined there. Then we have IP layer, where ICMP and IGMP and all protocols are run. Over that we have a transport layer, where we have TCP and UDP mainly, there is SCTP. And over that we have applications running. And what are the application we said SMTP that is called simple mail transfer protocol which you use for transmitting of emails, transfer of emails. Then you have FTP which called file transfer protocol where you transmit a file from a server to the client. Then we have HTTP that is hypertext transfer protocol which are used for transfer of web pages when you transfer web pages from a server to a client then we use HTTP protocol because web pages are stored in the form of hypertext and the hypertext has to be transferred that is called HTTP. Then we have DNS domain name services and that is if you look at when you type an address you type like www.google.co.in or www.google.com is an address of a Google server. Now ultimately it is easier for a user to understand in the form of text like www then dot then google dot com. But these all addresses has to be ultimately converted into IP address because each machine worldwide has a unique IP address. So the www dot google dot com address which is called a domain which is called a domain name or address or an URL this has to be converted into an IP address of the machine which stores Google server, where the Google server is located. So how these addresses are converted because ultimately if you remember all protocols the actual transfer is taking place between networks through IP address. So this domain name server has a task of converting these domain name addresses into logical address that is IP address and vice versa. Then you have SNMP that is called simple network management protocol that is not used by a user. The network uses this SNMP to manage the network operations that is where this falls under the category of infrastructure service kind of application. So SNMP simple network management protocol which is used for management of the network if something happens in the network it must recover. Then we have telnet that is also a traditional protocol SMTP, FTP, HTTP and telnet and are the traditional services. The DNS and SNMP are the infrastructure service based application protocols. Now, one of the function we talked about of application layer was addressing mechanism to provide addressing. Now if you look at the TCP IP protocol, we have four kind of addresses now. We have physical address, we have logical address, we have port addresses, we have specific addresses. Now if you remember, we said the physical address is provided by the MAC layer. And then we said that the internal layer is provi uh, provides a logical address that is your IP address, internet protocol address. Then we said the transport layer provides another address that we call port address. That means each service running there must be provided a port address which connects with the transport layer. So the port address is the address at the transport layer logical address is a IP address which is at the network layer, physical address is both data and physical layer combined that is a MAC address if you 
talk in terms of network, it is a medium access control layer address. Now, the specific address which you are talking about, it is an address of an application, right? So, as I said, www.google.com is a specific address, right? It's now, so if you look at that is what I am explaining here again. Now, all layers you look at, we said physical address is for back and data link layer and then logical address for IP and this port address is for transport layer and TCP and specific address for these processes which are running as an application. Like a client is a process, it needs an address. Server is a process running on the server side that also needs an address. So, both sides needs address and these are called specific addresses now. <coughs> and if you look at these services, we talk of DNS. So, it matches a domain names with the IP address. Domain name as I said www.google.com is a domain name and that has to be converted into IP address of the Google server. Then you have HTTP used to transfer data between client and server using web browser. The moment you use web browser like Internet Explorer, that uses HTTP protocol. Now, keep one thing in mind. The moment you use a browser, many times what is a browser? If you look at browser is a collection of clients and it displays data to the user in a right format basically. The moment I am saying this through an internet explorer or a Mozilla or by some other browser, you can either download a web page, you can download a file, you can also see an email, right? Address you open email address google.gmail.com. So now, it, if you are using HTTP, then browser using HTTP client. If you are using mail transfer or email through a browser, that means browser is using email client, that is SMTP client. If you are downloading a web page, it is using HTTP client. If you are transferring a file, it is using file transfer protocol based client. So, that means it runs multiple clients at the lower level and whatever they transfer then it displays on the screen. So, browser has this task. Then you have SMTP that is simple mail transfer protocol or POP post office protocol 3 used to send email messages from client to server over internet. So, SMTP and POP3 they are used for transfer of email, emails from client to server or server to client once more. Then FTP allows download of files and upload of files. Then Telnet is another service which allows user to remote login. That means you can log in to a server which may be at US from a machine as a client from here. That means it is not that they are on the same place, they are far, away, far apart and you are logging in to the server at the remote location from a remote client. So, Telnet is a remote login service, right? Log in to a host from a remote location and take control that is what the Telnet is. Then DSCP, Dynamic Host Configuration Protocol assigns IP addresses, subnet mask and default gateways, DNS server and so on and so forth. That means, if you are running internet services, as an organization you may have limited number of IP addresses provided to you. You cannot have a large number of IP addresses. Like say, you have only 256 IP addresses you have obtained from the agency, so that you can use and connect to the internet. But 256 IP addresses, if I take that class C address and out of that two addresses, three addresses are gone, you are limited with say 250 or something. Now, in your organization, there may be 500 clients. If 500 clients are there and then 250 addresses cannot be assigned to 500 clients. That means only those 250 machines will be working, rest will not work. So, therefore, what do you do? You provide a local address, local IP address, private IP address because some address, IP addresses are private IP addresses. They are reserved to be used by the private, by the organizations which will not be used for transfer in the internet per se. 
So you assign a large number of addresses from the private addresses so that these addresses other organization can also. Private addresses means any organization can use those addresses. That means I can use in my organization, you can use in your organization same addresses that is what the private addresses mean. The public addresses cannot be used by duplicate organization. That means the addresses, public addresses which are assigned to me or to my organization cannot be assigned to any other organization. If that happens, there will be a conflict. Because you may be using same IP, I may be using same IP, then who is using this? There will be a conflict. So the public IP addresses are assigned to only one organization, but the private IP addresses can be used by multiple IP, uh, organizations simultaneously because they are not used for transfer of data on the internet. Only public addresses are used on the internet for transfer of data. So that is why I said if you have only 256 addresses in your know, organization and if you have more than 500 clients then you cannot assign 256. So what do you do? Take private addresses, it may be more than 250,000 addresses or 10,000 addresses assign each user a unique private address and then your DSCP will map those private addresses to the public addresses so that they can transfer data to the internet. That is how the DSCP is used. This specific address is called a uniform resource locator or web browsers utilize several high level protocols that I said HTTP, SMTP, so and so forth. A uniform resource locator specifies the following things. Number one, a protocol used, the host name, allies or IP address, port number, path to data request, a resource requested. Full path, that is if you look at it's a C colon something something dash 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 full directory that is what path mean. And within that you may be looking for a file, you may be looking for a web page that is what the resource you are looking for. And the port number is the address of the process. The host name that is the server may have an address that is what host name or server will have an IP address and the protocol used. And what does it mean? Now look at this. When you use a web browser, what do you use? You use HTTP. If you are using HTTP, you write HTTP colon slash double, then a host name colon then port slash path slash resource. That is how your URL is. So like if you look at this, I said HTTP dot then double slash then I say JNU dot AC dot in. That is the host address of the JNU server. Then I am using dot 8000 port number, maybe for something HTTP, secure HTTP. Then CS7354M2016 is the path, is a directory there. And then within that directory, there is a file called lecture lact.ppt. That is the resource I am looking for. So lecture.ppt is a resource. CS37354M2016 is a path name. 8000 is the port, jnu.ac.in is the host name and HTTP is the protocol I am using. So if I am, this is if I am using my web page. If I am using a file transfer, now the protocol I am using is a FTP. Now it becomes FTP colon slash then host name, then port, then path, then file. So I said FTTP, then jnu.ac.in, then 25, then I can provide the path name for that, whatever it is. If I use telnet, I can write telnet, then host name, so and so forth. And the port used for telnet is 21. And if I am using a local file, then I can simply say file, colon, and path name, and file, so and so forth. So your browser can use all these protocols. And if you look at port, what I said, telnet I use 21 here, for FTP I use 25. Now. These are some standard ports. Now, if you look at what is said, there is a DNS, there is a FTP, there is HTTP, they are all standard protocols or services which every user requires to use. So, they are designed by the designer or the developer of an operating system. So, they come part as a part of the operating system. Whereas, as a user, you can design and develop your own client server services. So, now if you look at FTP user 2 port 2021, telnet is a 23, SMTP 25 and so and so forth. 
HTTP usage port number 80. Now, how does this HTTP service work? Now, if you look at this working of this, you type a URL on the bar, you do that, like HTTP dot dash then double colon then slash Google dot so and so forth. That is what you type a URL on the bar. Then the browser checks the DNS to convert this specific address into IP address. Then after receiving this IP address, it connects to the server, whether it is HTTP and HTTPS or secure HTTP, then it sends a, a, a function which is get, that means it try to get some data from the server. Then HTML code as a web page is transferred to the browser and then browser interprets this HTML code and display in the proper format to the browser window and to the user. That is how the whole HTTP and the web server works. And if you are using something else that is file transfer protocol and it will work the same way that you type FTP and so and so address on the URL bar and the browser look for the domain name server to convert into IP address and then request to the file transfer protocol and accordingly the file will be transferred from the server to the client. So, this is how the whole uh, client server application runs. Now, here what we talked about is we talked about only few standard services SMTP, FTP, Telnet, HTTP. The standard means everybody needs. In addition, those who are interested, they can learn client server programming. Once you learn client server programming, you can write your own client server applications and write application for your own requirements. That is what it is all about for today. Thank you. Uh, dear friends, on that note, we would like to thank Professor Lobial for coming to our show and delivering this wonderful lecture. And thank you, dear friends, for watching our show. Stay tuned and keep watching. Thank you.